This podcast is a product of the Florida Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Nothing in this podcast should be considered legal advice. To find a collaborative professional near you, visit www.collaborativepracticeflorida.com. I'm Katherine Eaton, a collaborative family law attorney and a member of the Florida Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Today's guest is Dr. Kristen Wallace. Dr. Wallace is a board certified mental health clinician with a degree in marriage and family therapy from the University of Central Florida with a PhD in psychology from Capella University. She currently practices in Melbourne, Florida working with high conflict families and conducting social investigations. She is nationally certified child custody evaluator and forensic mental health provider. She's an adjunct professor for UCF in the clinical mental health program for master's level counselor education students. And she currently serves on several boards in Brevard County, including she's been the past president for Space Coast Mental Health Counselors Association, the mental health director of the Postpartum Support Network, serves as a board member for Counselors for Change, and the mental health director for the Brevard Collaborative Association. So welcome, Kristen Wallace. Thank you for being um, our guest today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to chatting about collaborative. Well, then my first question for you is, how did you find out about collaborative, the collaborative process, and how did you get involved in the collaborative process? So being a mental health counselor, um, one of the things that I'm sometimes asked to do is testify in court on cases that... um, have children that have mental health issues so that the court can understand what's going on with the child and make a decision uh, based on what the science says about how parenting should go for children with certain disorders like autism, ADHD, anything neurodivergent that isn't the typical parenting experience. And so um, I believe it was 2017, I was invited to be a professional to speak just in general terms to the court. And during that testimony, the attorney that requested me to be the expert, um, she basically said, wow, this person kind of really cares about, you know, the mental health of children and how they experience divorce and their parents after divorce. And so after my testimony, she walked up to me and stated that she would be getting in touch with me after several weeks in order to potentially um, be involved in a new movement that she was starting in Brevard County, Florida. And so um, several weeks later, she and her partner-in-law invited me to lunch, explained the collaborative process to me. And it's at that lunch that I feel like my entire practice transformed and uh, I bought right in to the process. So uh, 2018, I got trained and uh, 2019, I joined their board and it's been collaborative ever since. That's a great story. Tell me, what is your favorite thing? This is a very broad, what's your favorite thing about the collaborative process? What does that bring to families who are going through a divorce versus as you just said, you've testified in court. So explain Uh, the difference. Well, there's so many differences. I'm not sure I could pick just one, but I'll pick one theme and then how we as collaborative professionals address that theme. Um, It's my belief that um, part of the problem with traditional court-related divorces is that it doesn't account for the generations of trauma that have existed prior to getting in that courtroom and discussing how the dissolve of the relationship is going to go. And it's, it's my observation that 
a lot of times court just perpetuates more cycles of trauma. What I love about collaborative is that there's a team approach with at least two, if not several other professionals in the room with clients as they are making decisions about their own lives. And the process itself lends to assisting couples in addressing very hard, emotional, heavy topics, but in a way that promotes healing and in a way that minimizes further trauma to the family system. So for me, um, my favorite part is that the outcomes tend to be a lot more cooperative, a lot more able to digest as the person who's been through the divorce. Um, and frankly, because that's the timbre in the room, um, it's just a better process for the professionals as well, because we're not so contentious. Um, we're not fighting. We're really able to use creative strategy to assist clients in getting the best thing they can out of their divorce. When you say creative strategies, that sounds wonderful, but can you give speak to that a little bit more? Because in court, um, I haven't seen any creative strategies. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> but yeah, it, but if, it, if people get the opportunity to have a creative strategy, what are they getting versus uh, uh, going to court? And and how does that creative process uh, you know, transform? I'll, yeah, I'll tell you, um, many cases come in and are not, they're not going to actually be, a, the issues won't actually be addressed in court because the law in court is like the sun. You have to follow it and you have to, whatever a judge comes up with has to be what they deem to be equitable. Um, and there are certain I guess I would say definitions or parameters of what equity looks like in the court system. And that's typically time and money. Those are typically the two things um, that, that the court is really focusing on time with children and money or assets or even debts and liabilities with a couple. And in collaborative, while, while the law is important, and we definitely follow it. It's more like a star and we are, um, we're using it as information because oftentimes the things that we're looking for out of a divorce process aren't actually time or money. They're things like um, uh, pre preserving relationships between people, having flexibility um, when necessary that, the court just basically says, if if you need to be flexible, be flexible and try to work it out. They can't dictate what flexibility is going to look like. Um, and so in collaborative, we actually talk about the why behind people want certain things um, in their divorce proceedings. So instead of just saying, well, I want 50% of the time, the, the couple is asked to really describe what the underlying motivation is for the 50% of the time. And sometimes when we are asking the why, we can actually address that why in a very different way than what the court might be able to do. Um, I'll give uh, I'll give an example of a case, if that's okay, that I was on. That would be great. Yeah, I was on this case here in Florida um, and they basically walked through the door for collaboratives stating, we know we're going to move <laughs> like within the next six months to a year. And one of the partners was in school in Florida and the other partner was going to move to um, somewhere in the Northeast of the country. And so, um, we essentially got to sit down and strategize 
parenting plans that would not have been considered in the court. Parenting plans that included looking at the the one parent's um, schedule for school because in in a bachelor's program you tend to have a about a year and a half's worth of schedule already out, um, and then the children we we just kind of said we know they're going to be moving to this county. We don't know exactly where in that county yet. But we were able to strategize ways to build in long weekends that made sense for the children and the parent that was in school. Um, we were able to talk about um, timeshare in a way that that really made sense rather than the cookie cutter taking a 14 day stretch of time and dividing that out. We could actually say it looks like there's this fall break for dad. There might not be for the ch the children, but we're going to go ahead and allow the children to stay out of school to be with dad. Like it was this this very um, strategized plan for how they were going to handle the next year and a half after the move. Um, the court never would have cared. <laughs> the court would have said, well, we don't know where they live and we don't, you know, let's just say spring break for the kids is this summer is that, and he can have timeshare if he's in town, but we actually built in what those timeshare experiences would look like. Like dad's going to get a Airbnb. Um, they're going to have, they're going to split the costs of rental cars. Like there was a, just a lot that went into planning how timeshare was going to take place and the Florida court system would not have been able to dictate that given that they were going to be moving in several months. So they also wouldn't have gotten to a final decision before that move, uh, which is another positive of collaborative. You we you decide the pace of your case. And so, um, you know, this family didn't get stuck in a legal system that would have forced them to remain in Florida and put their life on hold until they could get a decision or move without any sort of parenting plan protections in place until that residence had been established for six months or more. So those creative strategies really assisted the family in finding a resolution and moving forward in a way that really took into account mom, dad, and all of the children. Well, that's a great story. And <laughs> I I know you know several more. It, give me a suggestion because we've we've worked on a collaborative case together. So what can do you what's your role as a facilitator when you're dealing with the professionals? And how do you keep the case moving forward with the creative strategies, with the parties? And um, making sure the professionals, the attorneys, don't get in the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> you guys were from fighting with each other. Um, <laughs> so essentially, the collaborative process only requires two attorneys, but the collaborative process encourages the use of four professionals, and that is two attorneys, a financial neutral, and someone that's called a facilitator or you might hear a mental health neutral practitioner. So um, I always suggest, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to sell myself, but I am <laughs> a facilitator. So my job as a mental health professional in the room is to do a number of things that are pretty silent. Um, I'm reading the room and making sure that um, as we hit topics that cause friction, as we have major questions land in the room, my job is to read the temperature of what's going on and make sure that, um, you know, that the structure of that meeting is being productive. So I may look and see that one of the parties um, is overwhelmed with information. And that's my opportunity to suggest a break or to ask that client if they would like to, to have some sort of 
breakout meeting with their attorney or with me, depending on what's happening in the room, and give them an opportunity to, to break away from six people in the room together to just a dyad. Um, I'm also, as the facilitator, making sure that all of the information is very clear and given to both clients in a way that's um, easy to understand. Uh, I can assure you that if if I'm in the room confused about what the finances are, they are probably confused as well. And so I ask clarifying questions. In my cases, I also keep the notes, the minutes of what's happening in the room. And those minutes are really important because they memorialize the decisions that have taken place. They memorialize the options that have been placed on the table. Um, and they're a reference point for the attorneys, the financial professional, and the the clients to look back on if they have a question about what went down. And then my other job is to write all of the agendas, to think about certain things you might not think about, like where people should sit in the room and what type of words we should avoid using um, if I know of any hot button topics that might come up while we're having the discussion. So as the mental health professional, it's my job not only to be the administrator of the meetings and the entire process, but to also um, make sure that I'm keeping the comfort that should be taking place in the sessions themselves. Thank you. Thank you for um, explaining. I knew what you did. <laughs> All right. you. I don't okay. know how you do it, but I know that you are good at, at your job and having you in the collaborative process certainly makes it easier for the attorneys because you really do facilitate and keep that uh, neutrality between the professionals when it's so easy for attorneys to, yes, we want to represent our client zealously and how do we do that in the collaborative process by uh, and not get the parties adverse to each other. So it's. Yeah. I mean, it's a very different ball of wax than litigation. You know, the attorneys are typically in litigation. They're there to win a case. You know, they're presenting their position or their side of the matter. And they're asking the court to grant them whatever it is they believe is appropriate based on their side. My job is to tell the professionals, there's not just two options. There's. <laughs> Many, many, many options. And um, we don't have to be adversarial in this process. Um, I mean, and it's hard sometimes for attorneys to take off that litigation hat and just come to the table ready to work because that most cases prep all all month long, all year long, all 17 months long in Florida for an event they prep for a war and collaborative is not an event. It's a process. So I'm often looking at attorneys and saying, you know, you, you think you have the answer, but it's not our answer we're here for. It's, it's the client's answer that they come up with collectively together. So, so sometimes the attorneys are mad at me because I have to put them back in a neutral position themselves. But, um, but Essentially, the the thing that comes about is that clients then see that it's okay to disagree. It's okay to have to be on different pages and to recognize that we as professionals are actually modeling for them how to address those conflicts and being on separate pages. That's a good explanation of um, what takes place in collaborative versus um, versus not. Can you speak just a little bit because people are now learning the word collaborative and the collaborative process. Um, 20 plus years ago, people were learning the word mediation. Right. right? right. <laughs> and then there's a difference between mediation and collaborative. Can you yeah. speak to that a little bit? Because I'm, you know, I'm sure you, 
you're qualified to mediate a case, but yeah, I'm I'm certified to to mediate cases. Um, I don't prefer mediation over collaborative. Um, you know, mediation is one neutral professional going back and forth and helping two people negotiate their best outcome. And the thing that I that um that we hear in the mediation world the the myth in my opinion is that if if both parties leave upset with the outcome then it's been a great mediation and i just then what a horrible way to practice i'm sorry like that just that lands so uncomfortably for me as a mental health professional um basically negotiation in mediation is positional. It's two people starting on opposite ends of the spectrum and trying to move to the middle. And again, the framework for that is just like the court dollars and cents and a two week time block. <laughs> like it's, it's essentially <laughs> just talking about those two things. And so, um, the difference in collaborative is that we don't start from a position. We don't start from what do you want? We start from um, this idea that we're, we're interested as professionals in knowing at the end of this entire process, how do you want to feel? What are the things that you're looking for um, in the way that your family is going to move forward? And and essentially, we're we're looking at things like it's really important that at the end of this process that I'm situated in a secure financial position. That's different than saying I want half the house, right? Half the house is actually your solution to being in a secure position. So is there another way? to be in a financially secure position that might not include the house. We look at the whole picture of what's going on and we build options that might give and take in different areas. Um, and then by the end of the process, you have an entire package that is your option. Whereas mediation is, okay, let's talk about this, half that up, Let's talk about that, structure that out percentage wise. Let's talk about that. And so you're just kind of ticking off and going down the list in mediation. In collaborative, you're building an entire package. So what might be interesting to you on a vacation, like going on excursions, might not be interesting for the other party who would want to sit and relax with an umbrella drink and get a massage. So we're able to talk about those two kinds of things and then figure out a way for to make both of those things work at the same time. Um, that's not what they do in mediation. <laughs> so I like the collaborative process for that reason. I know why you want uh, the things that you're asking for. And if I can figure out a way for you to get that and your ex to get what they're wanting as well, um, then it's a win-win. And we walk out all feeling happy and heard and understood. And um, both of the clients are then also aware that the other person in the room cared about their interests as well and took the time to build a package that worked for them too. <laughs> That's the difference. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. And thank you for being our guest today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And if anyone has any questions about the collaborative process, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to consult with you free to give you some information and help you identify um, whether this is the right process for you. How, and how do they find you if they want to reach out and get some more information? www.completefamilyconsultants.com or you can call the office at 772 361 one four one three great thank you so much for being a guest today you're so welcome